Amen. Put your hands together and praise God. We have a story. <clears throat> Man, thank you, James, for that story, your story. Well, uh, week two of our collision series, everybody say collision. collision. If you will, turn to uh, a passage. Well, you know what? I'm not going to tell you yet. I'm not going to tell you yet. But it's good to see you turning or putting up on the phone, your phone. But uh, I-, I was taught... Um, a portion of this teaching that I want to share with you today. So it was taught to me, and man, it is just stirred in me, and I like to say just been marinating in me, and man, it was a collision for me. And in this series, Collision, we're talking about when our lives collide with Christ, there's an incredible collision, and normally a collision could be a bad thing. But in this situation with Christ, man, a collision with Christ is a great thing. And so we have so many people's stories that we want to begin to share in the context of our church and build community through our stories. And so this series is going to launch that, but we want to hear your story, man. Let us know. Shoot us an email, but we're going to be very uh, strategic and intentional with it. We want you to write out your story. We'll give you some guidance with that. And let me say this, it's not, it is about your middle seat of your story, your encounter with Christ, how you met Christ. But I was talking to a a lady in our church, an older lady in our church, and was just talking to her and her husband about them possibly sharing their story on video. And her story was similar to mine. I I gave my life to Christ at the age of nine, not far from here, at Caroline Baptist Church. And, man, it was real. It was the real deal. And, man, I didn't have a lot of life before Christ. I didn't do a lot of of drugs before I was nine years old, okay? And, uh, And so... But what an incredible testimony, man. It took just as much of the blood of the lamb to save me as it did James, right? And our stories are different. And so as she was talking about her story, just sort of sharing like me, like, man, I don't know if I really have a story. I've, I've been serving Christ since I was young. And I was like, man, you do have a story. But also, there may be some defining moments. We'll talk about this more, some table moments in your life that, man, people need to hear that. It could be somebody in the balcony right now has been set free from from an eating disorder. And that's part of your story. And there's someone in this wing over here that, man, they need to hear that part of your story. Let me just encourage you, if there's parts of your story that you keep under the table, let me say this, you're robbing God of glory from where he's brought you from. Man, bring it here and magnify his name with that. So I praise God that through Christ, when we're born again, we have a story, but also in our relationship with him, man, God continues to develop our story, right? Through our mistakes, through the good, bad, and the ugly, man, God's developing our story that he can use in other people's lives. And as I was thinking about this and just thinking about this text and this this truth that has been taught to me and then just how the Holy Spirit was expanding on that in my own heart I just thought, man, I need, to, I need to share this during this collision series. And I, I tried to get away from it, by the way. Some of you aren't having deja vu. We've had a table on stage not long ago during the table series, right? And I struggled with it going, ah, I don't want to go back to the table. And we didn't hit on this part of the table that I'm going to hit on today. But I just kept feeling like the Holy Spirit was saying, man, His truth needs to be heard. And, man, it's just been stirring in me. And, and let me say this. <clears throat> I believe that today. This truth, for many of you, if not all of you, like it was for me, will be a time that you look back 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, some of us 30 years down the road, and you're not going to remember who taught the teaching because he wasn't a great teacher, but the teacher, the Holy Spirit, spoke to you that day, and it was a moment in time where God changed things for you. A moment in time, no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, no matter if you sit in the balcony or down low, man, a moment in time today because of this truth that is going to change things for you, for all of us. Now with that said, turn to Psalm 23. Now it always gets quiet when you say that because it's like, come on, man. (laughs) We know this passage. You do know I know Christianese, right? I, I know this passage very well. And, and that's great. That's great. It's right up there with John 3.16. It's, it's wild, though, the longer I live in the context of this world, 
I find that there's a lot of people that don't, don't even know John 3.16. Experiment on that one. And so there's a lot of people that don't know, do not know Psalm 23. Now, here's what I found, though. A lot of us, man, we think we, we know it so well, so we don't get real excited about it. Man, I'm beyond this, right? And if that's our heartbeat, which is where mine was, and not our heartbeat, but our mindset, I think that's sort of where I was. And if that's where you are, then you probably need this truth more than the person who is going to hear this text for the very first time. But what we do is we go, Psalm 23, come on, man. My, my neighbor that doesn't even go to church, man, he knows Psalm 23. Man, it's on the movies. It's on TV shows. Man, it's, it's needle-pointed on a pillow in my grandmother's house. Man, everybody knows Psalm 23, I will agree with you on this, that Psalm 23 is woven into the fabric of our culture. But the truth of it is not lived out by so many in the church and definitely by those that are outside the church. I'm not talking about a building. I'm talking about capital C Church, those who are born again, those who know Christ. Well, again... If I said, hey, do you know this passage very well, Psalm 23, and I had you stand and just begin to quote it, some of us would think we know it because we've known it over the years, but we might stumble. We'll stand up and boldly say, man, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And it, I, I thought of Barney Fife when I was thinking about this. Um, Barney Fife, uh, if you don't know Barney Fife, man, I remember this. Vi it's my favorite episode he says, I know the preamble to the Constitution. I know it well. And he said, okay, well, share it with us. And he goes, um, okay, um, I'm ready. Um, um, and Andy helps him. Andy goes, we, 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 we. And Andy goes, thee, we, thee, we, thee, we, thee, we, thee. And Andy goes, people. Oh, yes, we, the people, we, the people. And it continues on. That's probably the way we are with Psalm 23, man. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. All the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, right? But some of you know it very well. But do we know it? Do we really know it? Well, what I want to ask you today, in the very beginning, as I set the stage for the table, how many of us, are really living in the promise and the power of this text, Psalm 23. Here's why that's important, because God Almighty is, is putting a promise and possibility on the table for you and I today. He's been doing this for me. Revealing that, man, he's set the table. There was areas in my life where I'm not sitting at the table and enjoying the promises and the, and the possibility of who he is. And if we will take him on his promise, things are going to change. Things are going to change. There's something in the balcony, man. You need change today. There's something down low and in the wings, in the very back. Man, we need change today. We need change. Well, with that said, Let's stand and read together this familiar passage, Psalm 23. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. You just say that back to me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is our focal passage for today. We'll get to it eventually, I promise. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We praise you for it. We truly do. Father, help me, help us to live it. Holy Spirit, 
Be my teacher today. Holy Spirit, be our teacher today. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said loudly, amen. You may be seated. Yeah, I heard that back there. Somebody here. Yeah, man. Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. From that just screams three questions for us this morning as we, as we set the table, all right? Three questions just scream out. Here's number one. The first two are going to be interactive. The last one will not be. More uh, introspective, okay? Here we go. Is he, Jesus, a shepherd? This is not a trick question. Is he, Jesus, a shepherd? If you believe that he is, raise your hand. All right, some of you are going, oh, that's a trick question. Hold on, keep it up, keep it up, hit up. Let me go ahead and say, hold on, let's bring him down. Rewind, here we go, ready? Is he, Jesus, a shepherd? It's not a trick question, you ready? Raise your hand if you think he is. Okay, that's good, a little better. He is, he desires to be personal. He desires to be your and my personal shepherd to lead you and guide you. Not some distant thing or, or person, person in the cosmos. He's not a cosmic killjoy up there with a gray beard waiting for you to make a mistake and go, right? Man, he wants to be personal, a personal shepherd. Question two. This is interactive and introspective, but the last one, just introspective. You ready? Not a trick question. Is that shepherd Jesus? Is he shepherding me? Is he shepherding you? Raise your hand. All right. You put it down. Thank you. You're asking the question with that. What's wrapped up in that? Is he doing for me everything he's promised to do with me in me that he promises in this text? Psalm 23. Please listen to me. I gave you the third question last. I mean, second. Sorry. Here's another question. How many of you would say that he is your shepherd? Raise your hand. Your shepherd. And I know some of us can't raise our hand. Some of us raised our hand, and he's not your shepherd. But when you say that, you're saying you're in a relationship with the shepherd Jesus. You can say that he is your shepherd. And in that shepherd, the question was also, just a moment ago, is he shepherding me? Is he doing everything for me he's promised to do within the text? Listen to me. The reason those questions are important, the reason they leap from the page to us, when we say, you're my shepherd, man, I shall not want is you and I have a shepherd who wants to shepherd us today. We say, man, okay, I thought, I thought we called pastors shepherds. We do. That's, that's a biblical term. Now, I do believe in the North American church context, we've made pastors something God never intended for them to be, right? Never intended to place them on a pedestal, right? It's just farther they got to fall. So we're not place, placing pastors or earthly shepherds on a pedestal. The only one worthy of that is the shepherd, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, right? Right? Okay. Man, but you and I have a shepherd who wants to shepherd us today. He's offering, here's what's wrapped up in that. Man, it's, he's offering a relationship. And we know that. A lot of us in this room, man, we know that, but do we have that? The only thing that will keep him from shepherding me, you may got an idea, is me. That's the only thing. And I know for some of us, this is surface, we feel like it's surface level. Okay, man, I know he's the great shepherd, the good shepherd. I know I should be letting him shepherd me. But man, as we move closer to the table, remember setting the table right now. As we move closer to the table that's set for us in verse 5, man, we need to understand, I mean, do we truly have that relationship with him? Has it just come out about church attendance and that's all good? Has it just come about serving in the church and that's all good? Man, it's, it's about that relationship with the shepherd. Part of that relationship, and this is what gets us, it gets me, I don't know about you, but in part of that relationship, and this is a stumbling block for some of us, man, he, he wants to make us do something. He says it. 
He says he's going to make us do something. And, the, and there's people in the room, this is where you're postured. Even if you speak Christianese, you might be postured here. You go, man, that's why I'm not going to surrender this area of my life. That's why I'm not going to surrender my life to him because he wants to make me do something. You may say, well, I, I know that he's saying to do this, but he's not going to make me do that. You're not going to make me do nothing. You ever had that conversation with people in our horizontal relationships? Some of you had that conversation with your spouse on the way here. You're not going to make me do nothing. Hey, y'all, hallelujah, praise the Lord, good morning. Hey, good to be at church, loving Jesus. Shut up, right? Man, because that human nature, you're not going to make me do nothing, right? But verse 2, he says, he makes me. But why do we get cop so much attitude about that? He's saying he makes me lie down in green pastures. I don't have a theological dissertation of that green pastures for you right now, but all I know is, here's my translation, that's good stuff. You say, you want to lie down in green pastures? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, let's do it. Make me. But it's that make me part. Because we, it brings up something in us, in me, that says, I, I don't need someone to lead me. I don't, I don't need a shepherd. I can, I can be my own shepherd, my own boss. I, I call the shots. Here's the problem with that. I and you, you're a sheep. By the way, the Holy Spirit of God wasn't giving us a compliment when he called us a sheep. Anybody ever watch sheep? They're as dumb as a box of rocks. And they look, look, at you, look at your neighbor and say, you're a sheep. Now, what you just told them is, you're dumb. And some of you said out on the way here, you dumb, you stupid. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good morning, church, right? But I just gave permission. You just said, you're a sheep. Listen to me. Go watch some sheep for about 15 minutes. Make a list of positives and negatives. They don't run great. They don't see great. They're not the smartest animal in the animal kingdom for sure. Neither am I because I can't even say it. And most of all, here's what they need. Leadership. Hello. That's what you need. That's what I need. As leadership in this church, as pastoral leadership shepherds, man, we need leadership from the good shepherd. Or we might as well pack it up and go to the house. You can let him make you Lie down in green pastures. And that's going to become more clear what that looks like today. Or you can go lie down in the desert if you want to. I've done it. Is anybody over here laying in the desert? We could have testimony after testimony. But I don't know why. <laughs> the Holy Spirit was wanting me to lie down in green pastures, and I kept laying down in the desert. Man, he, he wants to make us lie down in green pastures. It's this simple because he loves us. You know, we sing, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us. But do we, have we grown, grown complacent to that? I say this a lot because I, help me never to grow callous to the cross of Christ Jesus. Man, help me never to go, grow callous to the empty tomb. Man, what that means for me. Man, it's the love of Jesus, man. He makes us lie down in green pastures, makes us because he loves us. And sometimes he needs to make us lie down. We could have testimonies in this room, for, especially those who have lived some life where the Holy Spirit of God has laid you down. 
He has made you lie down. Anybody felt that before? Some of you. He'll do it because he loves us. And here's why he does it. That's why he has to make us because we're not smart enough to lie down ourselves. Right? So don't get so, so worked up, Neil. Don't get so bothered because he makes you do something. Remember, he's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He continues on, and I'm just going to sort of flow through this, but it just communicates how he wants to be a personal shepherd. And then we're going to dive into verse 5. It says in Psalm 23, because it's personal, he leads me beside still waters. Let me ask a question. Anyone need to be led in your life? You need leading in your life. Okay, if you don't think you do, then you really need it, okay? You really need it. And when we're sitting there going, I need somebody to lead me, Jesus is going, I've got this. I, I, I'm pretty good at it. You want to do it? Okay. But I'll be right here. I'm the good shepherd. Just let, won't you let me lead you? Man, he restores my soul. Man, there's so many people in this room, and you need that right now. For him to restore your soul. Man, you've let some stuff rob your joy. And he wants to restore it. Man, David said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Man, he had allowed some things to come to his table, right? And he was going, Lord, I've sinned against you and you alone. Restore unto, the, unto me the joy of my salvation. Man, it says he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Man, it's just personal. Even though I walk through, he's not going to keep you there. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Man, your rod and your staff, man, they comfort me. Man, they protect me. You think the shepherds walk around just leaning on it? Right? <laughs> no. And he's got, man, he'll pop a wolf inside the head with that staff. Pop right on top of the head. If a wolf's coming to get his sheep, man, he'll pull, he'll, he's got a hook, man. He pulls the sheep away from danger, pulls them back on the right path. And some of us this morning, this is where you are. Man, he's trying to make you and pull you, and you're going, no, I'm going to do it my way. I've got a better plan. I'm going to lead my life. I've been there. And I'll probably be there again. But he's the good shepherd. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I mean, there's some people in our church, in this room, that you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But fear no evil, for he wants to protect you, man, he wants to comfort you. And then here it is, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, man, it's personal. My cup over, overflows, man, that just communicates blessing and favor for your life. Man, he wants to pour that out on your life. And a lot of times we get in our mind frame because of false teaching out there that that's cha-ching and bling-bling. It's not. I'm going to tell you, here's the blessing and favor on my life. That I am born again. Man, that I was given the opportunity to receive Christ as my Savior. And standing before you is a guy who no longer will spend eternity in hell, but I am going to heaven. If I die today, if I pull out and a truck hits me on 221 today, have no doubt that I have been blessed because I have been born again. Man, I will be in heaven today. And some of you, that is not the case for you. That's enough blessing for me. That's enough favor for me. But you know what? He's going to give more. And then it says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, we're getting closer to the table, all right? Psalm 23. 
Some of you say, man, all that looks good. Man, it sounds good. It looks good in a frame in my guest bathroom at my house. I'm 23. It looks good on the wall. But here's the question. No, he wants to be the good shepherd in your life, in my life. God is offering you a different day today for some of you. Man, he says, I'll bring you a different lifestyle today. But we got to put our faith and our trust in Jesus, the good shepherd, and let him lead. But listen to me. But whether or not he is shepherding us, it's up to us. He's given us free will. He's not looking for a bunch of robots to say, I love Jesus because I've been programmed to love him. I love you, Jesus. I want to worship you, Jesus. He doesn't want that. You're his child. He wants you just to love him because he loves you, right? Well, whether or not he's shepherding us, again, it's up to us. We got to trust him for everything that he's promising us in his word, but we're zeroing in on Psalm 23, and then we're going to zero in on verse 5. So I want to focus on one of the things that he is promising us right here, okay? It says in verse 5, look at it, he prepares a table before us in the presence of my enemies. And this is personal. This is a relationship. This is fellowship. And I am so glad I get to spend time with you at the table. Can I, can I get you something to drink? Right? I really appreciate this personal relationship. And man, you have whew, you've set an amazing table. Wow. This is pretty incredible. I don't even like celery, but it's good on your table, right? That's good. Man, I don't like broccoli. I'm not doing that, but I'm glad it's on the table. Mmm, that's good. Man, thank you, Jesus. Man, that's, man. Have you, have you been to the table? Get you some of that, Pete. You like apples? Not really? Not the green ones. Well, you can give it away to some. Well, I'll give you a red. I got some red ones here. Thank you. All right. Hell, do you like grapes, man? I'll tell you what. You do? I'll tell you what. Here you go. Y'all share these. Pass those around. <laughs> yeah. Any, any broccoli likers in here? Probably. Seriously? Man, y'all need to repent. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> broccoli? Who's some broccoli in here? Right here? Get you some broccoli. Now, y'all ain't got nothing to drink. Now, don't everybody start getting up going to get water, okay? Man, I'll tell you, this is I got it from, I thought you was going to get snatched one of those peppers up. There's some broccoli in there. Anybody like peppers? They're not hot. They're sweet. Sweet. Get you one. Choose your color there. That has got mold on it. I'm just kidding. Oh. God, look, y'all got grapes everywhere. Okay. Hey, 10-second roll, grab them. Okay. And I, I want to share, man, what God has blessed me with at the table. We need to share it. We'll get to these. Right? Mm. Some of you want to get to them since you walked in. I know. You told me. But he says, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All that stuff has just been resonating in my heart. But this right here. I was telling Jeremy and some of the guys, I was like, man, this is just, whew. this has just been stirring in me. As I was taught this truth, it's just, just reverberated in my heart. What is an enemy? We know the enemy, Satan, the liar, the loser in the name of Jesus, right? But enemies can be circumstances that are closing in on us. An enemy can be a diagnosis that you didn't see coming. Maybe a person has just stabbed you in the back more than once. Maybe it's somebody that's just undermining you in the office, right? Maybe it's a family member and they just, 
just drip poison in your relationships. And man, they want to undermine the family. And they're just always sowing and poison in every situation and sowing ill will in the situations. It can be an external addiction. Maybe you're addicted to cutting. Maybe you're, you have an eating disorder. Maybe you're a gossip. You ever met those people that, man, they just drip poison? They just drip poison in the workplace or different places? Three of you? Well, I need to walk where you're walking. Let's rewind that one. Anybody ever been around people just drip poison? Yeah, yeah. Are you, if you, are you one of them? Raise your hand. Just kidding, I'm just kidding. I hope not. Here's what we want this text to say. At least I do. We want it to say, God says, I'm going to prepare a table just for me and you. Just for me and you. And I'm going to take down your enemies. I'm going to take them down. Now, let me say this. He can. Amen? He can. But that's not what he said. He says, I want to prepare a table in my presence, but I'm going to prepare that table for you also in the presence of your enemies, right? Right in the, why? I don't, I don't understand. My tra- boy, I want it to translate a lot better, right? But he says, I, I don't, I'm going to prepare a table right in the middle of your circumstance. I'm preparing a table. Now, now here's what hit me. This is just another way of saying it. So write this down. I got, I'm going to have one big idea that I really want you to get, but, but write this down too because he's saying, I'm going to prepare a table, a place of, peace in the pressure, right? The pressure can be going on, the circumstances going on, but he, he prepares peace in the pressure. He prepares a table in the midst of the pressure. He prepares a table in the midst of the circumstances. He prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. And this is what it looks like. Man, just spending time with the Father. Man, that personal relationship. Man, thank you for being the shepherd. Man, praise you for what, you, what you've laid out before me. Man, I cannot wait to get to these. Man, thank you so much. And here's the thing. What a testimony to your enemies, to those who know you're in the circumstance that you're in the pressure, what a testimony in the midst of your circumstances to your enemies, right? And here's the thing. Sometimes he needs the pressure in the circumstances to help us understand something, to help us to grow in something. This hit me yesterday in a fresh way. I'm thankful that God allowed me to be raised in a Christian home. Anybody raised in a Christian home? Can you just say, thank you, Lord? And I'm definitely um, not a perfect parent. And none of you are either. And neither were my parents. but I'm thankful for the home that I was raised in. And just thinking about this was just stirring in me. And then yesterday, my dad was, uh, he was working on my hot water heater that, that burst. It was in bad shape, took it out, put it back, put another one in, and pipes started where it had burst underneath the house. Water's going everywhere. Now, my dad has realized, I'm now 51, and he realizes that the con- The skills that the God gave him, he can build anything, take a car apart and put it back together, I think. He can build houses. 
I can't even hammer a nail. Okay? Can I get amen? Anybody else? Just me. I'm the only one that can't hammer a nail. But I think a few years ago, I remember my dad saying we were doing something. He said, well, son, I finally realized that you just didn't get it. You know, you didn't get it. <laughs> he probably doesn't remember saying that. But I remember it not in a way like, oh, thanks, Dad, slapping me around a little bit. No, it was like, ooh, I'm glad you realized I, don't, I didn't get it, you know. But yesterday, and, I, and I please know I'm going somewhere, and this, I hadn't planned to share this until it hit me in the first service. And glory be to God, because my, my dad's not perfect. Again, none of us are. But he came over, and he was having to tear out the floor, and I'm there behind him. I'm go for this and go for that. You need anything? You know, go for this. I'm good at that, by the way. And he was down on his knees in this closet where the hot water heater is and trying to figure out how to get to the stuff. And he had a smart, somewhere else he had to be, and this was like early in the morning. And, um, and all of a sudden, he stopped. And he took off his hat. He said, son, we forgot to pray. And he prayed a prayer that much more eloquently than I can pray. But it was to an audience of one. And if things would have went smooth or if they didn't go smooth, he's still king, right? He's still Lord. But in that moment... And after that moment, my, the Holy Spirit brought me back to the table. And my mind went back to when I was a sophomore in college. I was home for spring break. And uh, my dad got word that my mom and my two younger sisters were, hit in a, were in a head-on collision. Come around a curve, a guy in a Porsche, and they were in like an old Chevy car and just but they're on Chase High Road, came around a curve and just head on. Thought we were all three of them, we were going to lose all three of them. Um, And there's a lot in the midst of that that God was doing in our family's life. And I could just give you things of how God, we're doing so many things there, but what stuck out, the Holy Spirit brought me back to that moment about he is the good shepherd and trusting him because when my dad did that, in such a simple thing, fixing a busted water pipe, my mom went back to that day in the, in the days and the weeks and the months to come where my dad was going from Spartanburg Hospital to Charlotte Hospital to Rutherfordton Hospital because he had a family member in each hospital. Not knowing if at least two of my older, my middle sister and my mom were going to even live. And I remember, I remember... He was just trusting the good shepherd. I can't put my finger on how. I can't think, put my finger on how my mom was. But I just, my mind and heart went back to that, that, man, that's what we have to model for our children. That's what we have to model for the people in our circle of influence. That's what we have to model for our enemies. That, man, and they, they are watching Man, in the midst of the circumstance, in the midst of the pressure, man, he is still the good shepherd. He is still the one we trust. He, we still let him lead us. We still let him guide us. Even if it feels like chaos, man, he is in control, and we've got to trust that. But sometimes he needs the pressure and the circumstances to help us understand something, to help us grow in something, us, to grow this relationship. That he uses those things and allows those things to, for the pressure to mold us and to make us and who he desires for us to be. But in the midst of that, and this is what I saw, was the relationship. Was the relationship. I want to give you a statement that I just, I just wanted to just, just to resonate in your heart as we move forward this morning. And here, here it is. Well, I want to give you a scripture before I give you that. In Revelation 3.20, if you can turn there or scroll there, it'll be on the screen, but something about flipping. And I'm, I'm getting ready to close here in just a minute. 
But in Revelation, you know, it's to the church. And, we, and many of us, if you speak, if you speak Christianese, man, you, you know this passage. But it, we, we've used it a lot, and we, we say, hey, it's, it's for those that are needing to come to Christ. And it's Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We, we use that, and it's okay, you know, that, hey, the Holy Spirit is knocking on the hearts of people that don't know him. But in the context of this, man, the Holy Spirit, God, is speaking to the church, and he's saying, hey, I'm knocking at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. He's prepared a table, and I mean, I'm going to come in, and I'm going to eat with him, and he with me. The King James, the old King James said, come in and sup with you. I like that better. What's up? We're going to sup, right? Come in and just like sup, you know? It, it just communicates, man, just spending time together. Let, let's, let's sup together, right? Relationship. Because here's the thing. We didn't come here today. We didn't come here to celebrate a religion. If you came here to celebrate a religion, you came for the wrong reason. Man, we, we came here to ce celebrate a relationship. That's what I saw with a busted water line that took me back to when he thought he was losing half his family. A relationship. And here's the big idea. Write this down. Because here's what we have to realize. It's not what's on the table. It's not what's on the table. It's who's at the table. That's what it's about. It's not what's on the table. Man, so thankful for that. But it's who's at the table. It's about relationship. It's about the, the good shepherd. Let him lead me and guide me. No matter what comes, no matter what pressure comes, Man, there is a table prepared in the presence of pressure, in the presence of my enemies. And that's where I have to stay, at the table, right? And, he, and here's what I found, too. <laughs> I've done it in my life. You've done it in your life. I'm sure my dad has done it in his life. We, we have an enemy and his name is Satan, lowercase s, because he doesn't deserve a capital S. And we give him a seat at our table. I've done it. Things just going through my heart and mind right now. You're doing the same thing. Balcony, how have you, how have you given the enemy a seat at your table? Hey, 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 what's going on? Man, nice table. I like this. I like this. You mind if you get me something to drink? You mind? You mind if you get me a little something to drink at your table? Man, I like this food. Man, this is good stuff right here. Man, you care if I have some? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, carrot stick. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We give them a seat at the table. You know, that, that woman on Facebook who's been connecting with a little bit. She uh, probably need to let that go a little farther. Because you and your wife, your relationship, it's, uh, it's going downhill quick. Yep. Mm-hmm. Who's married in the room? Raise your hand. I just saw my victim. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. Come on. Man. The enemy, he doesn't deserve his seat, does he, man? Mm -mm. Right? Mm -mm. Y'all uncomfortable as I am? <laughs> <laughs> this is what he does, right? He, 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 tries, he gets a seat. In our marriage, it's not his seat. Can I get amen? amen? And I'm telling you, that's what's going on 
in many of our lives. We, we have given him a seat at the table. We've given him a seat in our marriage, and he doesn't deserve that seat. He doesn't. He doesn't. There's no seat. Sorry, I didn't mean to kick it that far. <laughs> I don't know my own strength. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Rusty, I know you were jumping up. I know you were protecting there. I saw it. <laughs> but isn't that crazy? But here's what we'll do. That'll happen. I'm not going to kick it again, I promise. But we go get it. And we, whoa, we put it back at the table for it. What is that all about? I've done it. You've done it. Man, he does not deserve a seat at the table. No. He has no seat at the table. Only the one you give him. That's it. You you ever been out to eat? Uh, Maybe on a date night? You see somebody? And they come to your table. And they won't leave. All right? Next thing you know, man, they they don't pull up a seat. Y'all mind if I sit down with you and talk for a little bit? I I, I tell you, what we need to say, I'm on a date night, and yes, I do. So guess what? Ain't no seat available. Because there's a relationship going on here, right? But I'm telling you, 1 Peter 5, 8, bring it on the screen if it's up there if we've got it he says stay alert stay alert because the enemy the lion he is prowling around he's prowling around and you know what he's doing he's prowling around looking for someone for a marriage to devour But it can only happen if we give him a seat. You can prowl around all you want. <laughs> There's no seat at this table. There's no seat for you. He's prowling around, and I'm just trusting God. I'm letting God lead me. Mm. Pressure's come, man. He's prowling around. And guess what I'm doing? I done moved to the good food. Woo! Mmm. <coughs> yeah. Man, there's nothing like grapes and red velvet cupcakes and celery all, all coming together. I've done. Mmm. John 10. We know it well. We think the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus, thank you, Jesus, he has come to give us life, life to the full. But Jesus, I know this. It's not about what's on the table. It's about who's at the table. Thank you for being here. But this is the part I don't know that we remember. Verse 11. He says, in this, right after verse 10, <coughs> he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd. Lays down his life for the sheep. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Here's what I realized too. Sometimes I, we, try to fight battles. And we're just supposed to Sit at the table. <laughs> some of you are trying to fight some battles because you got an enemy. 
you got pressure, you got circumstances, and you're like, I'm going to fight a battle. And the Holy Spirit said, no, no, no. I got this. Just, just sit at the table. I prepared a table for you. I prepared peace for you in the midst of pressure. After the first service, Melanie Green, who was in our first service, part of the Element family, she came, caught me downstairs in the cafe. She said, I got to tell you a story. It's just happened just recently. I think she was saying this past week. A lady that was, uh, I think she used to teach me Sunday school at one time when I was at Caroline Baptist Church. Her name's Janie. And Melanie and Janie are good friends. <clears throat> and she was telling me that Janie recently, and I think it was this past week, she uh, was uh, getting in her car, I think it was in a parking lot or somewhere, and as she was reaching for her car door, she looked and saw a guy that was pretty suspicious looking. Well, she went ahead and quickly to get in her car while well, he took off running towards her, right towards her. Before she could get in and lock her doors, he jumped in on the passenger side. He got in, he had a gun, he stuck it in her chest, in her face, and he said, give me your money. The Holy Spirit led her to begin to quote out loud to him Psalm 23. Just over and over, making him more mad. Give me your money. In her pocketbook, which was sitting there, on the top was her wallet, but she was in the process of moving, so she had quite a bit of cash down in the bottom of her pocketbook. It wasn't in her wallet. She handed him her wallet, Nothing in there, no cash. He got mad. She continues to quote Psalm 23. Finally, he says, I want what all you got. And he gets the money down in the bottom and gets her pocketbook. She's continuing to quote Psalm 23, and she says, I want you to know that I love you and God loves you. And this man broke down and said, I know God loves me, and I love you. And he got out of the car and left her and left her money and everything. Man, he, he wants to fight our battles. He can give us peace in the pressure because he's prepared a table, right? And that's an extreme situation. But man, bring it back to just everyday life, to our marriages, to our relationships, our vertical relationships in life, our workplace, our church life, man, our thought life. Don't give him a seat at the table of our thoughts. Something else I've realized we do, maybe it's just me, but I don't think it is. We identify these enemies in our life. I'm talking about horizontal enemies, people we interact with. And they do us wrong. They do things to us because we live in a broken world. And what happens over time, and it's like a poison taking one drop at a time, we build up walls and we get, get the clench in our fists symbolically in our life. And, and nobody's going to have... We're keeping people away. Nobody's going to have anything to do with our life. And, man, we've got, we're sitting here at the table, and, and it's hindering our relationship with the good shepherd. He's prepared a table for us in the midst of our enemies, in the pressure, in the circumstances. And, man, I cannot take the fruit of the table and let God use it in other people's lives when I'm like that. And I'm missing out. I'm missing out that I'm able to say, man, can I share the fruit of the table that I'm experiencing with, can I share it? I couldn't do this with clenched fists. I couldn't. And he's saying, man, I want you to share it. Share the fruit of the table. You've been wanting one since we got here. I know. Yeah. Man, just share this. Come on. Man, I'm not going to live in fear. Man, I'm not going to let the enemy... Since y'all got fruit, I'll let you have a donut, I mean the donut, cupcake. Man, sorry. 
man, we miss out on so much because of that. So much. But it was recorded in the Gospel of Luke to love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those that persecute and misuse you. I, I can't do that without this. I, I can't. Outside of this, I'm wicked. Outside of this, my righteousness is but filthy rags. Without this, I'm going to hate my enemies. Without this, I'm going to crumble under the pressure. The message translation says, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. Some of you are sitting at the table, and you've allowed the enemy to have a seat. You've got the diagnosis, and he's going, don't trust in Jesus to heal you. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. It's a lie, and he's not even supposed to be at the table. You've given him a seat at the table, and he's saying, you know, you just need to give up. Man, nobody cares about you. Just, just give up. Everyone's against you. You realize he's not supposed to have a seat at the table, right? With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just be as quiet as you can. Let's just, just stay here in the quiet of the moment. you're here and you say I there's some areas of my life where I have uh, given the enemy a seat at my table maybe it's an addiction Maybe it's an addiction to a drug, as we've mentioned earlier, addiction to alcohol, addiction to pornography, addiction to material things. It could be bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. There's no way I can mention everything that the Holy Spirit is stirring in the hearts of those in the balcony, down low, in the back, in the front. But the Holy Spirit of God, not because of a great earthly teacher here today, but with the power of the Word of God and the Master Teacher, the Holy Spirit, He has stirred things in your heart. And he's placed His finger on some areas where you've allowed the enemy to have a seat at your table. Today, right now, I want you to visualize me kicking this chair across this room. And that's what, through the power of Jesus Christ, needs to happen today. Today, in this room, in so many of our lives. He has no seat. He will no longer have a seat at your table. It ends today. Today. Now, it ends I know without a doubt because of what God worked in people's lives in the first service. 
that we're set free. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's someone that you love, that you care about, your child, a, a coworker, a parent. And they have given a seat to the enemy. Man, I look across this room and stories in this room of people that I know had given a seat to the enemy. And today, man, family that had been praying and, and praying, Lord, bring them back to the table. Lord, get that seat of the enemy away from the table. And, and finally, breakthrough. And they're sitting here today, a testimony that they're sitting at the table and there's a table prepared in the, in the presence of their enemies. And man, God is, is growing that relationship. And now people see that. They see the fruit of the prayers. They, they see the fruit of what God has done. If there's someone you love or, or it's you and you have given a, a seat to the enemy, I, I feel led to be very intentional this morning with this. I, I, I feel led to do this from time to time. I, I want to pray for you. As I begin to look around the room here in just a moment, as you look up at me in just a moment, with the invitation that I invite you to respond to, there's no way I know every situation, I can't remember every face, but there's something about making a move. And you're saying, the enemy does not have a seat at the, at the table of this person I love. In my life, he will no longer have a seat at my table. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to begin to my left, your right, and any of those, just you say, man, I, I or someone I love I've, has, a, has given the enemy a seat at the table. And I'm just looking up to say, hey, I, I'm giving this to the Lord. He no longer has a seat at this table. To my left, your right, if you're in this section, just look up at me. I want to I pray with you. Thank you. No one looking around but the people that are saying, hey, the enemy no longer has this seat. No longer has this seat. Amen. Amen. I'm looking back to the back in the left section. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move up to the balcony. The balcony. Just look at me. If that's you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. L listen to me. I I'm just a man. But the Holy Spirit of God is supernaturally in this moment. Man, he's coming to the natural, and man, he is he, he's kicking the ta this chair away. The enemy has no seat at the table. In this middle section, just look at it. I mean, if that's you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Praise God. Praise God. To my right, the wing in this whole section, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise his name. Praise his name. Father God, we praise you. The enemy has no seat at our table. The ones that we're thinking of that we love, or the enemy has no seat at their table any longer. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of of the blood of the Lamb. Father, we thank you. There is freedom. Father, that they are just begin to just enjoy the fruit of the table. And Father, then they begin to testify that how you have bought, brought peace, this, this table of peace, how you have prepared it in the midst of the pressure and, and before your enemies. And God, there is no seat for the enemy at this table. God, we praise you for it. Father, even in this moment, as we look up and we pray for one another, God, you are bringing peace. You're bringing freedom. Father, you're growing that relationship with you. God, we praise you for it. We thank, thank you that you're a supernatural God, that you go beyond the natural, and we praise you for it. Father, I just feel led that anyone in this room who in their past, they, they were abused, 
physically, verbally, sexually possibly by, by a parent or a, or a loved one or just someone they knew, Lord, that just stirs in me. Father, that, that they're not giving the enemy a seat at the table. Father, they're gonna forgive. Father, they're gonna be in the walk and just trust you and walk with you more and closer in relationship. God, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, that's what we say this. Our ministry team will be down front. If, if you looked up and you need someone to, to pray with you, I'm gonna tell you something, one, so many things I love about Jesus. But when he walked this earth, something that I believe he modeled for his disciples, he would take special effort and he would walk over and he would lay his hand on people. I mean, he would touch people. You know, you can pray for someone and, that, and that's great, but when you lay your hand and touch them on their shoulder or, or man, it's, it's like, it's something, it's different. It's, it's different. And maybe you just need to come and look at someone and let them just lay hands on you and pray for this situation in your life, whatever it may be. But also I wanna say, maybe you're here and you've never, you don't have a relationship with the Good Shepherd. It's just some cosmic person out there as far as you know. But today, the Holy Spirit of God is drawing you. Drawing you. You can't come to Christ without the Holy Spirit drawing you. So if you're coming because some man is given an invitation, don't you come. But the Holy Spirit is drawing you right now. And you realize that you've just been walking in religion or you... Maybe today you said, man, I, before I came here today, I didn't even believe there was a God, but I want a relationship with the good shepherd. It's so simple. Repent. That means to turn from sin and self and turn to a savior, Jesus. You don't have to understand it all. You're just saying, Lord, I believe. I believe you died on the cross for my sins, Jesus. I believe you rose from the dead. Come into my life. Be my savior. Be the good shepherd of my life. Lead me. Guide me. I trust you. I give you my life. It's that simple. He's not looking for this eloquent prayer. He's looking for the sincerity of your heart. He sees it. Give your life to it. The altar is open. Ministry team will be here. You can come. You can pray. Man, maybe couples need to come and pray because the enemy's trying to get a seat in there. Man, he is defeated in the name of Jesus. Man, but you come. If you need someone to pray for you, you come. Ministry team, you come as we stand to our feet.